very uh, happy to have with us uh, Christine Watkins. She um, uh, blog in the internet. Um, I want to recommend to everyone in the parish that we use uh, her um, place in the internet, uh, queenofpeacemedia.com, as a spiritual resource. On the website, you'll find Catholic books, CDs, videos, blogs, and resources for prayer and healing. There are good resources uh, for that parents need to protect their children from the dangers of technology and also the filth in the internet. Please sign up for the Queen of Peace media newsletter if you wish. Uh, we'll be giving you cards as you leave tonight and you can, uh, in that card, you'll find this information to where to go to, to, to get this material. And, um, uh, this table, and there's um, a table in the back with some of these things. Um, the, um, uh, as you leave, uh, we'll give you the card, as I said. We'll also be looking into linking this website to our parish website so that people can have a link and take advantage of these resources. So again, welcome. Um, so um, Christine, you'll begin then, okay? <clears throat> I have good news for you. You get to sit down now. <laughs> because it's so important to have the gospel message going out on the internet, I'm also going to start a weekly YouTube video that'll be on the Queen of Peace Media YouTube channel. So if you sign up in the back for the email newsletter, you can find out more about that as well. The whole purpose is to spread the gospel where people are clicking if you know what I mean. So tonight I'm gonna to talk about the Holy Mass, celebrating understanding and living the Holy Eucharist. There are two ways to attend Mass and see the Mass. One is through the eyes of the world, and the other is through the eyes of the Spirit. So let's theoretically think about what it's like to participate and live the Mass through the experience in the eyes of the world. Let's say you're a parent. It starts at home, often on Sunday morning, right? And what is the parent thinking? It's going to be a miracle if we get there on time. Parents start shouting, run around, screaming, going, everybody, you got to do the hour fast before the Eucharist, you know, as the parent secretly takes a bite of a bagel, hoping that nobody will notice. And they get in the car, they get there. It's a miracle. They're there on time. They try to go to the pews. The teenager runs off. The parent doesn't know where the teenager went. The seven-year-old does a belly flop onto the pew. The five-year-old little girl says, I gotta pee. And the parent says, well, didn't you pee at home? Yeah, I peed at home. Well, you don't need to pee again, do you? I do, I gotta pee again. So the parent takes the kid to the bathroom, comes back. The parent never sees the teenager again. That was the last time he was ever seen. The mass begins. Suddenly, the parent realized the gospel was just proclaimed. The parent doesn't remember the gospel, and the parent thinks, oh, I'll read the gospel when I get home, but the parent never really does, right? The parent promises him or herself. Never happens. The homily comes. The homily is a beautiful sermon on patience, love, tenderness, kindness. The parent looks at her kids and says, shut up and listen to this. The parent's like, okay. It's the Eucharist. Let's all calm down. Let's be reverent. The parent starts to think, I don't even know if I believe this. Is this, you know, this stale way for God? I'm not sure. But the parent doesn't tell his or her friends that he or she really doesn't believe, but she tries. She's like, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power. Would you get that pen out of your sister's ear? Thank you very much. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the... For the last time, I'm telling you, that collection envelope is not to be used for paper airplanes. Did you throw that at the deacon? Did I see? Did you throw that at the deacon? Holy, holy Lord. And then it's time for Eucharist. Okay, goes up and receives.
comes back down. Where's your brother? I don't know. Where's your brother? I don't know. She never sees the brother again. Oh, the priest says, go forth. The mass has ended. And the parent says, thanks be to God. (laughs) That's how we can sometimes experience the mass through the eyes of the world. But there's another view. We can experience the mass through the eyes of the spirit. And who better to teach us how to do this than to read about the Eucharist from the saints. And I picked up some quotes from certain saints. How to experience the mass beyond the naked eye, beyond the physical senses. St. John Chrysostom said, when the mass is being celebrated, the sanctuary is filled with countless angels who adore the divine victim immolated on the altar. So what just happened tonight is this church was filled with countless angels. St. John Vianney said, if we really understood the mass, we would die of joy. He also said, put all the good works in the world against one holy mass. They will be a grain of sand beside a mountain. St. Padre Pio said, It would be easier for the world to survive without the sun than to do without Holy Mass. St. Lawrence Justinian said, No human tongue can enumerate the favors that trace back to the sacrifice of the Mass. The sinner is reconciled with God. The just man becomes more upright. Sins are wiped away. Vices are uprooted. Virtue and merit increases and the devil's schemes are frustrated. And finally, St. Francis of Assisi said, Let the entire man be seized with fear. Let the whole world tremble. Let heaven exult when Christ, the Son of the living God, is on the altar in the hands of the priest. O admirable light and stupendous condescension, O sublime humility, O sublime humility, that the Lord of the universe, God and the Son of God, so humbles himself that for our salvation he hides himself under a morsel of bread. There is only one way that we can experience mass like that. There is only one way into that reality. And it is through the human heart. So don't forget to bring your heart to mass with you. Sometimes we just bring our bodies and our heart is somewhere else. Our heart has a million worries that it's caught up in. Our heart is worried about taxes. Our heart is worried about family. Our heart is worried about the world. Our heart is understandably worried about the terrible scandals in the church. Our heart is distracted. Our heart is thinking about so-and-so's hairstyle and -and so-and-so's pants and -and so-and-so in row number four of the pew that they had an argument with. But is their heart with Jesus, did they bring their heart to be in the spiritual reality of the Mass? Because if we leave Mass no better than when we came, we didn't really come to Mass. Our bodies did, but we weren't there. When we first come to Mass, we must understand that we're coming to the greatest gift God ever gave us. We're coming to a feast that's unparalleled. We're coming to receive the greatest gift we could ever receive. It starts with the liturgy of the Word. It starts with the proclamation of the Word. And what is the Word? God tells us through Isaiah chapter 55, 9 through 11. For just as from the heavens the rain and snow come down and do not return there till they have watered the earth, making it fertile and fruitful, giving seed to him who sows and bread to him who eats, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but shall do my will, achieving the end for which I sent it. The Word is God himself speaking to us. 
So when we just had the mass and we had these cute, adorable kids proclaiming the word, when anyone gets up there and speaks, when the priest gives us the word, when all of them speak, it's not really them speaking. It's God speaking, God himself. Let's use our imaginations. If God the Father were standing there, would we be distracted? Would we doze off? Would our, would our minds wander? Not so easily. We'd want to hang on every word because at every Mass, there is at least one sentence from the scriptures that is for you or for me. Every Mass, he has prepared to say something to you. And we have to sit there waiting to find out what it is as our Father is speaking to us. The word is power. The word is alive. St. Francis of Assisi has changed the world, started the Franciscan order. His conversion was multiplied when he sat in a pew, just like you, just like me. But he didn't just listen to the following words. He heard the following words through his heart. Go, sell what you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. The world has completely changed because that one man heard that one word. And we all know what happened to Mother Teresa of Calcutta when he, she heard the words, whatever you do to the least of these, you do unto me. The word and the world changed because she let God's spirit of the word come into her heart. Modern day people, same kind of thing. How many of you know of the late night show host Stephen Colbert? So let me just say he's famous for those of you who don't know. So he was in his 20s, his early 20s, and he became an atheist all of a sudden. He was raised Catholic, but to his great grief, he says, I just stopped believing and I thought, everything I've taught has been a total lie. And he was very sad. And he was walking along the Chicago streets. It was 1986, and he had just graduated from Northwestern University, and he was doing comedy at a local club and he was nervous and he was anxious and someone handed him a green pocket bible frozen he cracked it open and in the index it said look here to look for verses for this emotion or that emotion and because he was feeling anxiety he opened it up to that emotion and he came to the sermon of the mount and read therefore i tell you do not worry about your life what you will eat or drink or about your body which you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life colbert said that when he read those words i was absolutely immediately lightened and my life has never been the same the word has tremendous power. Then at the Mass, we change to the Liturgy of the Eucharist. Before that, we have the prayers of the faithful. They're prayers of the faithful. They're not just announcements of what we should pray for. When the person is reading the intercessions, that's for all of our hearts to participate in and lift up that intention. And then when the gifts are brought up, our guardian angels, mystics have said, actually walk forward with carrying bowls of our prayers to the altar with them during the presentation of the gifts. So we're giving to Jesus the bread and the wine needed for consecration, but we're also giving him our worries, our prayers, our needs to come onto the altar as well. So don't check out. Pray with the prayers of intercession. Pray as the gifts are brought up. Then, 
We're entering into the liturgy of the Eucharist, and it's hard to speak about it because it's hard to do it justice. Because Jesus, God himself, the one who created the universe, the one who is inside and outside of time, the one who created the dinosaurs, the one who created the deserts, the one who knew us before we were born, the one that knows everything about us, the one who died for us, the one who loves us beyond all telling. He comes to us so vulnerable, so tiny, so delicate, in the form of a morsel of bread and a sip of wine, because he loves us so much, he wants us to swallow him. He wants to course through our veins. He wants to breathe in our cells. He can't stand to be parted from us. He wants to be so intimate that he wants to be inside of us. And he trusts us with that. The creator of heaven and earth wants to be inside of you, inside of me. He can't wait. The saints who know what the Mass is, they couldn't go enough. When we know what the Mass is, we run to it. It's not the drudgery of, we got, oh, another obligation. Don't forget that after you receive Jesus in the Eucharist, he couldn't be more present to you. That is a sacred time. Right now, all of us who have been to Mass, that is a very sacred time because never in your life, except for right after communion, will your Lord be more present to you. It's a time to talk to him, tell him all your needs and your worries, your distress. It's a time to listen to him, ask him questions, ask if there's anything he wants to say to you. He's with you more than you're with yourself. He knows you and your needs more than you know them yourself. Don't think that God isn't with you. Don't ever think that God doesn't care. Don't ever think that God is far away. How could he be? He's in your own blood. He'll do anything for you, anything to get you to heaven, anything at all, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, your Lord, if you were the only person alive, he'd die on the cross just for you so that you could rise up to heaven where there's no more tears, no more suffering, and an internal embrace of love. If you were the only person on earth, he'd go through the entire crucifixion again just for you. Of course, for this intimacy to happen, we have to believe. We have to believe that it's really him. It really is Jesus. And to help us throughout the history, he's given us what is called Eucharistic miracles. There are many, they just keep happening around the world and throughout time. But I wanna show you a video of a very famous one called the Eucharistic Miracle of L'Anciano, which happened in Italy. And I'll now show you a video that explains what happened there.
We say, Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. We say that, let us pray that. So many things in a person's soul have been healed when they pray those words, when they pray the Mass. We can think of the Mass as a spectator sport and come and think that we're supposed to be the people in the stadium watching the game when actually we're supposed to be the players, the people playing the game. We are active participants. What happens when we have the Jesus in us and we leave and we're sent forth? We're sent forth to make disciples we're not sent forth to put God in a box and go forget about him that's not what the sending forth is about in the ancient church the priest or the bishop would pray over the person individually at the end of mass as a personal sending forth now you receive a collective blessing but it means the same thing when we leave we have Jesus in us what does Jesus do he loves he heals he blesses so what happens without our knowing it he doesn't show this to us because it would make us proud he keeps us humble he keeps it hidden like he hides himself in the bread and the wine he's very humble but we're walking down the street after receiving the Eucharist someone's getting healed on our left someone's being blessed on our right someone has a change of heart behind us and someone stops drinking in front of us 
It happens all the time. We are Eucharistic vehicles of light and love. And the more sinless we are, the more powerful that is, and the longer he stays in us. This we will find out when we die because we chose to go to Mass. And the more frequently we go to the Mass, more often this happens, that we are this vehicle of Jesus doing his thing inside of us. He doesn't suddenly stop being active because he's living inside of us. He is in us. And to make disciples, what do we have to do besides obviously love people, whoever they are? Are we to remain quiet? We're called to speak. We're called to speak. We're called to speak boldly with conviction and let that fire go from our souls and that fire of the Spirit enter people. That is our calling. If we're not convicted, if we don't really believe, who's going to believe? They're going to think, well, they don't really believe. Why should I? We have so much power, people. But let's talk about this. What are some of the things that keep us from telling people about Jesus? What are some of the things that think, that make us think, ah, I probably shouldn't. You want the other person to get to heaven. You really do care, but not enough to do or say what you have to do or say to help them get there. Let me ask you, what are some of the things that hold us back? Go ahead and shout them out. People playing the guitar? (laughs) Good. Rejection. People's rejection. It's a fear, right? Our ego gets in the way and it suddenly is about us. It's not about their soul. It's about our ego. What? No time to do it? I can't possibly say that because that could take some of my time. Well, why not? Yeah. Yes? Excuses, Yeah, that's what we're talking about now. We're, we're naming some of our excuses, right? What are some other excuses that we tell ourselves? Waste of time. Uh, ineffective time, waste of time. And I'm it, just assuming the defeat before we even try. Sin. Maybe we're feeling guilty and we're like, well, I'm not a good representative, so I shouldn't say anything. And sin itself can block us, yeah. Pride. What's an example? Can you give me an example of how pride could affect us? Can someone else also as well? Good one. Let's keep the peace in the family, right? It's already rocky as it is. Let's not insert Jesus and ruffle these feathers. Jealousy, what would the person be jealous of? Okay, good. Maybe more like um, coveting, like they don't want to lose the things they have. Fear of some kind of loss. Would pride maybe fit into self-image? Thinking of self-image like, well, I don't want to be seen a certain way. I have an image to protect. I have a reputation. I don't want any label thrown on me that isn't less than wonderful. (laughs) Sorry, what? Am I hearing things? Have I lost it? It's that time of life, isn't it? I'm a little old. What? Someone spoke? Do you want to speak again? Oh, it was in the back closet. Okay. It was the Holy Spirit. You should have just told me I was hearing things. I would have believed you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's saying, well, I'm imperfect and and people might see that I'm imperfect. So what right do I have to speak? Because I'm just going to be called a hypocrite and I'm not a good enough representative. Yeah. 
what could be a sign of weakness? I'll be, you have, we have to be very vulnerable sometimes, right? When actually sharing our story in a vulnerable way is when we're most powerful. Can you imagine being a parent going to their child saying, you know, I mess up a lot and I have a lot to apologize to you for and I haven't represented the faith the right way, but I just want to tell you that he loves you, he loves me and he's real. We can be authentic, we don't have to be perfect. good one uh it's, it can be extremely uncomfortable uh we have we're shedding our comfort oftentimes to share the gospel we're, we're going into like a round peg being fit into a square box and it doesn't feel good last night she had a conversation with a family member away from the church And what happened? In a nutshell. Ah. And you said? So what happened in a nutshell is she tried to share the Lord with someone and he put her down. It's kind of one of our worst fears, right? What does the, uh, what do the Beatitudes tell us happens when that happens to us? Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. You received a portion of the kingdom. We receive a blessing. We have to think more in terms of heaven when that kind of thing happens. I'll tell you what happened to me. My family doesn't believe, meaning my parents. And every seven years I have the talk. And so seven years was up. It was Thanksgiving. I actually wasn't planning on it, but I think the Lord goes, seven years, time to talk again. So I'm sitting there at their house and my dad's at the other table and I look outside and I see that it's raining it's a beautiful bucolic scene and then I get a sense of now would be a good time no one else is here so I go shoot you know I'm gonna be honest I don't I don't he makes me talk to people on planes he makes me talk to people about the gospel all the time he makes me hand people one of my books he's always doing that to me and sometimes I just I don't want to hear it but I try to be obedient, so I got up, I'm like, okay, you better, you better make this work, okay, come on. So I go and I sit next to my dad, and then my mom shows up, and then I think, ah, a reason for an excuse. Sorry, Lord, mom's here, it's going to be even more awkward. He's like, talk to her too, <clears throat> you know, okay. So I launch, hey, you guys, what do you think about God? An hour of God talk. Oh, it's kind of what I heard. I said, okay, what, what, are, what are your main objections to Christianity? I said to my dad. He said, there's shame, there's debasement, there's, uh, you know, just the Inquisition and listed a bunch of negative things. I said, okay, let me, let me undo that. And I started to talk about all the good things. We formed hospitals, we did this, we did that. I said, it's about removal of shame. It's not about heaping shame. I said, God takes away shame. He goes, yeah, but just say we're sinners. Oh, that's horrible. Okay, unpack that. What does sin mean? I said, sin means we miss the mark. Our heart sometimes closes. I said, dad, do you think people's hearts sometimes close? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, God's there to open it. Oh, well, yeah, what he was. That's what I kept hearing. So I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm getting nowhere. And then my mom and my dad, they kind of join each other in this an atheistic force. And they're supporting each other. And my mom's like, I have grown closer to your father over the years. And we think exactly alike. I'm like, that's terrible. And 
my dad's like, yes, I couldn't feel closer to my wife. And I'm like the atheistic bond, you know. And I'm like, okay, what? And then I'm just like, Lord, you made me do this. Okay, help me out. So I, I thought, what do I need? What I need is assurance at the end of their lives. If they're going to be this anti-God, this anti-Christian up to the last minute, I know by faith that the end of the, their lives... Jesus is going to come. I don't know how he's going to show up. In physical form, in light, in a voice, don't know. I do know he's going to be there and he's going to say, do you want to come with me? He's going to do that. He gives everybody a choice up to the last minute. And at the end of people's lives, even if they've had dementia for years, there is clarity. So I said to them, I said, I said what do you think is going to happen at the end of life? And they both said, oh, well, there's going to be dirt. And, you know, my mom used to tell me when I was eight to try to console me. Don't worry, honey. You're going to decompose and be dirt. And you're going to nourish the trees. I mean, that, that was the best consolation she could give. And I'm thinking, like 50 years later, you're t- still thinking the same thing. And it's, I mean, talk about dirt. And so... I said, she goes, I would like to, I will live on in the legacy of what I have done. And I'm like, what have you done? (laughs) I will live on in the legacy of my children and their grandchildren. And I'm like, I don't know my great grandfather. We're all going to be forgotten by our our kids' kids. They're not going to be thinking about us. So it's hyperbole. It's, it's, it's a nice idea, but it doesn't really mean much. So I said, okay, you, you're, you're, the, you're the pile of dirt, okay. I said, <laughs> it was very bold. I said, you're going to be shocked. You're going to be shocked. And I want you not to promise yourself. You don't have to promise it to God. You have to promise it to me that when God comes, Jesus comes, however he's going to show up. I don't know if it's going to be a light. I don't know if it's going to be him, but he's going to be there. When he speaks to you, I want you to promise me now that you're going to say yes. And go with him. And they're like, yeah, okay, honey. Yeah, yeah, sure. I was like, yes, I won. (laughs) That's all they gave me. But they gave me that. And they made a promise, and they're good people. When they make a promise, they mean it. They mean it. They think I'm crazy. But when that happens, if they don't remember, Jesus remembers. And I know what he's going to say. He's going to say, do you remember when you promised your daughter you'd come with me? And if nothing else, they'll say, yeah, we did. And we love her. Maybe we'll trust her, and maybe we'll trust who she thought you were. So, it was an hour engagement. It wasn't easy. We don't love each other any less. Nobody got hurt. (laughs) What else? Any other excuses that we give ourselves? That's a good one. Not having answers. Now, when I said we're called to give our own testimony... You tell someone why you go to Mass. You tell someone why, why you like Jesus. We can all do that. Do we have to have all the answers to give our own testimony? No, we don't have to have any. We just have to know what we've experienced and we feel. So we're always called to give a reason for why we believe. And then when it comes to answers, what should we do if somebody asks a question and we don't know the answer? What are we called to do? find out it's perfectly okay to say i don't know i'll get back to you go on the church websites ask father manuel and say got the answer for you it helps us learn there's nothing wrong with saying i don't know that is an excuse right so let us fill each other up give each other hope and know that if we feel like we've failed someone could say that i failed with my parents i don't think so I don't think so. I think I got their wheels turning. I don't think you failed. You got this man thinking. 
His demons didn't like you. His demons didn't like what you said. But God did. God appreciates your attempts. God is happy when you try. And what is our fallback if they're not listening to us? What what else can we do for them besides speak? Pray. And something I mentioned on the first night of the mission, do you remember? Fast. Very powerful. Our prayers and our fasting. Don't think that you're not powerful. Don't think that you can't change the world. Besides believing in the Eucharist to successfully spread the faith, we have to believe in one more thing. We have to believe in where we're trying to go and where we want them to go to. We have to believe in paradise. If we don't really believe in paradise, I remember I had a friend, she said, I don't know, it sounds so boring. I don't even like the harp. For whatever reason, she couldn't get it out of her head that paradise might be just so glorious beyond our wildest imaginings. She just couldn't get the cupid and the harp out of her mind. She's like, I can't listen to that music for very long. (laughs) It's so beyond our wildest imaginings, right? Jesus does say, I have prepared a place for you to go. And it's wonderful. You know, you can go on YouTube. A lot of people have experienced bits of heaven. And they come back to give their testimonies. And they're very inspiring. Very inspiring. So much to do. So much to see. I want to show you a video now. It's from, it's the people who were in the movie and the book Heaven is for Real. So you've probably all heard of that. Um... Colton and Todd Burpo, the father is a pastor, and his son, when he was very small, died on the operating table and actually experienced heaven. So I would like to show you uh, that video now. ago. Looking at Colton now, you would have never guessed that he almost died in 2003. His father, Todd, tells about Colton's near-death experience in the book, Heaven is for Real. And he started throwing up into the toilet, you know, and uh, at first we're like, okay, he's got the stomach flu because the doctor said it was going around. Colton's condition only got worse as days passed. His doctor discovered his appendix had burst and infection was spreading in his body time was running out then we knew we were in bad shape when they, they said well you need to come out to the hallway they separated us from everyone else and then someone came to us and started talking to us that uh, we gotta have surgery on your kid it was tough um seeing your boy be lifeless when he was a very vibrant child and it was at that moment that we were looking at each other I remember my wife holding Colton in that hallway, just us. He's not even moving. We went to the surgery prep area, and I remember them hauling him away and him just yelling at me, Daddy, don't let him take me, Daddy, don't let him take me. And I went back to the uh, uh, the pre-op room where we had left some stuff, and I was finally alone, shut the door, and I just broke down, and I was mad at God. I just was frustrated, fed up. I remember telling him, I said, God, after all I've done for you, and now you're going to take my kid? This is how you treat your pastors. You know, I was calling our prayer chain. I was calling anybody that would be on the other line to get Colton on the prayer chain because it was bad. We were there in the waiting room for an hour and a half, maybe. And I remember the nurse coming out. Uh, is Colton's daddy out here? I'm like, yeah, well, 
holds up a, a, a in recovery and he's screaming for you. And I'm sitting there with him. And I remember my son in that room then looking at me and goes, Dad, do you know I almost died? And my first thought was, maybe he overheard the nurse say that, or maybe they thought he was under anesthesia, you know, and, and he wasn't. But it wasn't till four months after we got out of the hospital that we finally listened to our son. And that's where I got to see heaven. No, Jesus and some angels came and flew me up to heaven. And I said, so Colton, what did Jesus look like? I knew that the first person I saw was Jesus. He was wearing white robes with a purple sash. And he just came down nicely and gracefully. Well, Dad, Jesus has markers. Dad, Jesus has markers. I didn't know what he meant. So I finally asked the right question, Colton. Where are Jesus' markers? And he drops his toys down. And he stands up. And he just points. Dad, they were right here. He takes his fingers, points to the palms. Then he bends over and touches the tops of his feet. And looks up to me. That's where Jesus' markers were, Dad. When I was in the throne room of God to start with. So I got to see what that looked like. I was upset because I didn't know what was happening. What God did is he used people that people or things that I liked to calm me down. From there on, I felt better. Then one day we're traveling together and he looks up at me and, Dad, you used to have a grandpa named Pop, didn't you? I'm like, yeah, he's really nice. Really? Yeah, you used to play with him as a kid and fix, work with him on the farm and, and shoot stuff with him. And I'm like, yeah, how do you know that? Well, he told me. Uh, a figure came up and he was Pop. He asked me, are you Todd's son? I said, yes. He said that he was his grandpa. So that's where I met him. Yeah, Pop, uh, I was very close to him. And he was my most significant male role model when I was a kid, growing up a kid. But he was killed in a car wreck before I turned seven. Um, I was busy paying bills again, because um, that's um, my job. And he came up and told me he had two sisters. Well, he had to say it several times before he finally got my attention. And finally, I put myself down and looked at him and says, what do you mean you have two sis sisters? No, I have two sisters. You had a baby die in your tummy. And I just looked at him like, well, how do you know you have two sisters? Well, she told me. And then he proceeded to describe her. She looked like Cassie, but she had brown hair. And first time when she saw me, she just came up and hugged me. We knew if this was true because he said she kept hugging me. She wouldn't stop hugging me, Mom, and I didn't like that. Well, I'm not really the hugging type. I had miscarried the weekend of Father's Day weekend, which made it even rougher. And we thought we'd dealt with it. We got never accepted that the baby had died. But when he said he had two sisters, I was... I think I was in shock first and then trying to realize what is he telling me and so I knew that he had seen her and after he described her he said she's just, she just waiting for you guys to come to heaven you know, as we talked about heaven and he was telling me all these wonderful details I just felt like I had to ask him did he want to come back I knew that I was leaving heaven because Jesus came to me and said Colton you need to go back even though I didn't want to go back, he said that he was answering my dad's prayer. I remember that prayer. That irreverent, that disrespectful, screaming at God prayer. <laughs> I was like, he's answering that prayer? Today, Colton is a healthy 11-year-old and shares his heavenly journey with boldness. I learned that heaven is for real and you're going to like it. So we're going to take a few minutes in silence to close, and Father Manuel will have a few announcements. God asked me three years ago to produce a lot of materials to help people find their way home. So really everything I'm doing is so that I can get home, and you can get home. And so Christmas is coming. Everything at the bath table helps people get home. If you can't afford it, tell me. I want you to have it if you want it. Or if someone comes to mind, please pass this stuff around. 
If you don't like evangelizing by word, at least hand people something. <laughs> hand them a book, hand them a DVD, hand them something that will open their spirit to realize who they are and where they truly belong. You have been wonderful. I have a few thank yous. I want to thank Father Manuel for inviting me to your parish. I want to thank you all. You are so wonderful. Oh my gosh, such a warm and welcoming community. I want to thank Elder Sousa back there with the camera. He has sacrificed his time. He's bought way too much equipment to help spread the gospel.